Uh, today I'm going to talk about one of the more challenging topics for any of us. All of us have faced it to one degree or another, and that's the question of why. Why the innocents suffer. And I want to acknowledge my indebtedness to Dr. Tom Long, who's a professor preaching at Candler School of Theology, Emory University, and his uh, recent book, uh, What Shall We Say? Uh, and the scripture this morning is from Matthew's Gospel, the 13th chapter. It's called the Parable of the Weeds. I want you to try to remember this uh, scripture as I'm talking, particularly as I get to the end of the sermon, because <clears throat> weeds and wheat, the owner sows good weed, good seed. An enemy comes and sows weeds. And uh, it's talking about the problem of evil from whence it comes. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. <clears throat> when the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? What's going on? Where did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and the, tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring in bring it into my barn. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word and such a challenging topic. Pray for me as I pray for you, would you? God, we give you thanks for the music, for the sense of mystery, the beauty of this place. All of these things that point to the reality of, the, of God and the goodness of God. Help us as we share together today in Jesus' name, amen. Many of you know the name Ted Turner. Started CNN, um, flamboyant. Many of you probably didn't know that when he was a youngster, he was very religious and was thinking seriously about becoming a missionary. When he was 15, his younger sister Mary Jane, 12, got a very intense form of lupus, that an autoimmune immune, uh, di disease that ate away at her cells caused constant vomiting, constant pain. Ted would come home, the story goes, and hold her hand and pray for her. He prayed that she would get well. She prayed that she would die. Eventually she died. Ted said, that was the moment I lost my faith and turned away from God. He said, I was taught that God was love and God was powerful. And I couldn't understand how someone so innocent shall be made or allowed to suffer so. Now, Ted Turner may not speak for us in a lot of ways, but he speaks for a lot of us in this way, doesn't he? And a lot of people you know, and a lot of questions you've raised, whether you've lost your faith or not, this is a powerful concern. And Ted, like so many, turn away from God in the light of innocent suffering. We think of... Um, the tsunami in Sri Lanka. The story of a father who tried to hold on to his four children and they couldn't hold on. He said, I knew they thought my father is here and he'll save us and I wasn't able to. Port-au-Prince, three years ago, devastating earthquake. One of you wrote me uh, such a poignant email. I'm grateful you're gonna talk on this because it's been a concern that I've had for many years and I went with some people from UF, this person said, and some people from Trinity to Port-au-Prince and there were all these bodies and all of this devastation and it was brought to bear in one little girl who her parents dressed in her Sunday best and say, would you make her well? And I knew we were gonna have to amputate her arm. And the irony of them presenting her in her Sunday best in this most terribly difficult thing we could go on, Sandy Hook, Columbine, the Ukraine where Stalin years and years ago s slaughtered millions of people, millions of people. 
or Auschwitz. And we're haunted. Or we bring it closer to home when a beloved family member suffers for no reason at all. When I was at Princeton, one of my colleagues was Bart Ehrman. Some of you know Bart's writings. They've become popular for some unknown reason to me. <laughs> Bart was a bright guy. He's written a number of books on early Christianities, he calls them. And one of his now more famous books is entitled God's Problem, How the Bible Fails to Answer Our Most Important Question, Why We Suffer. And in that book, he just pounds away. I've listened to it on tape. He pounds away at this notion of innocent people suffering before an all-powerful, all-loving God. And he comes to the conclusion, I can no longer believe in that kind of God. I can no longer believe in God. Bart grew up a fundamentalist. Now let me say this. I'm of the opinion that fundamentalism of any kind, whether it's Christian fundamentalism or Muslim fundamentalism, is wrong and it always leads to a dead end. Because what it does, it's an attempt to control the mystery of God. And you can't control it. You want to get it in your means. And so you create these surefire doctrines that will eventually erode. And that's what happened to Bart Ehrman at, uh, somewhere along the line in Princeton. He was invited to teach a class uh, on the problem of evil. And he came to that conclusion. I came to a point where I simply could not believe there's a good, kindly disposed ruler who's in charge of it. The power of his book is he speaks uh, our language and he states it so... Um, powerfully, strongly, um, no holds barred. He mentions, as all people who talk about this, this fourfold truth claim that there is a God, okay, God is all-powerful, God is loving and good, there's innocent suffering, and so something has to give, and you can't deny that there's innocent suffering, it's all around us. So then what do you do with the rest of them? He concludes, that therefore, there's no God. I want to submit to you today that this is a philosophical, mathematical, logical presentation that doesn't come to grips with the mystery of life. And that our definition of God being all-powerful is a projection of our understanding of power rather than the power of God that was shown in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Or in the parables that precede and follow this parable, Matthew 13, about the kingdom of heaven is like the mustard seed. When I think of these flowers, I think, what kind of power was at work in creating beauty? You see what I'm saying? It's a different reality than what we've been accustomed to thinking. The 18th century Scottish philosopher <clears throat> David Hume put it this way, is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he's impotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he's malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Whence then is evil? One blogger said of this quote by Hume, this single quote made me an atheist. What a great quote. He speaks for many in our world, and atheism is the largest growing, most rapidly growing faith <laughs> stance in our world. So what do we do with this? There have been people who've helped a great deal. Rabbi Harold Kushner wrote that wonderful book a number of years ago. Many of you have read it. If you've not read it, you ought to read it, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. He writes as a rabbi who's given love and compassion throughout his life, and he he writes not as a philosophical, esoteric, abstract. He writes in a very human level. And then he writes out of his own personal pain because his, his son Aaron, at an early age, contracted the illness or had the illness called progeria. And that illness meant, the doctor said, means that he will not grow past the age 12. He will never have any hair on his head or his body anywhere he will look like a very, very old person and he'll die at the age of 12. And that's what happened. 
And Rabbi Kushner had to dig deep and say, God, what is going on? This child is an innocent child. Why does this happen? And he could only think in his understanding of God that God, if God could, he would not have let that happen. And so he errs on the side that God is all loving but not all powerful. And I'm drawn to that. I'm drawn to that. But Christian understanding doesn't go there. The historic Christian faith is that God is both all powerful and all loving. But if you're going to err on one side, it may be the best to do this. And that's what Kushner says. Because he loves God and he knows God is a God of infinite love. Interesting, Bart Ehrman, even though he denies God, he misses God. He misses what he used to know in God. He misses, and I think there's a longing in each of our hearts. You can't talk about this topic without talking about Job. And I won't go through the whole story of Job, but you know the story of Job. He was innocent. Um, uh, all kinds of bad things happened to him. His friends came and sat with him for seven days. That's a good idea. If you know somebody who's hurting, go sit with them. Don't say a word, but come beside them. Listen to them. Be present with them. They made their mistake when they started talking and giving him advice. That, you know, you did something wrong. Otherwise, God wouldn't have done this to you. Never say that. Job strikes back, says in chapter 28, he asks this question, where may wisdom be found? Where can I find an answer to this? Job chapter 28 ends with the, the truth that there's some things that are a mystery and beyond our understanding. And I'm okay with that. You may not be, but I'm okay with that. And I think that's the truth. There's some things we cannot fully ever understand. And then chapters 38 to 41 of the book of Job, this is when God speaks out of the whirlwind and he says, who do you think you are? <laughs> were you there when I did this? And were you, it looks like God is overpowering, but here's what I think is happening. Job is wondering, God, I've lost everything else. Am I going to lose you too? And God says, no, I'm here. I, I'll never leave you. I, I'm God of infinite love for you. I think that's what was going on there. So let's go and spend a little time with this uh, parable. Could you bring the parable back up, Jay? It's such a powerful parable that we have gone through it, maybe never thought of it in these terms. Jesus told him another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in this field. That's God. God created the world and was good. While everyone was sleeping, his enemy, evil collection of evil, the devil, Satan, whatever you want to call it, sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. And the owner's servants came to him and said, sir, what is going on? Didn't you sow good seed? Where did the weeds come from? And the enemy did this, he replied. So we go on. I want to share three things about our scripture and Pray that they'll be helpful to you and to me. The farmer sowed good seed in his field, but at night an enemy came. And the uh, people who were working the farm said, God, where did these weeds come from? God, did you cause this? And the answer is an unequivocal no. No, 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 a thousand times no. God, but we thought you sowed good seed. Yeah. And what's going on here is the gospel enables us to rise up in protest. God, what is going on? Why did you let, why did this happen? And I would argue that that's a deeply Christian response, not a lack of faith, but an expression of faith. If we didn't believe in God, the God of Jesus, we wouldn't even cry out to God. John Claypool, a pastor in Louisville, his little daughter got ill and died and and he says, where do we come off as Christians thinking we ought not to cry out to God, to protest? God can take it. It's a form of prayer. There's more faith in a word of calling out to God than of quiet submission. And I encourage all of you to feel that kind of freedom. When we voice protest to God, we engage in a form of prayer. 
we actually honor God. God, I don't understand what's going on. God, why, why couldn't one nanosecond have been in that car that hit my daughter Siobhan? Why if it just a nanosecond this way or this way instead of the car hitting right here? And I don't feel bad about calling out to God that way. It's a form of prayer. It's an acknowledgement that God is God and God is there. Second thing the scripture says, an enemy has done this. God did not do this. Now I don't know if you're all going to agree with me or not, but that's all right. The landowner is making it very clear, God is not the source of the weeds. How many times have I been at a place of tragedy and some well-meaning person says, God did this, God must have had something in mind when God did this, and I want to grab that person honestly by the throat and say, don't say that. I don't believe that for a minute. God is a God of infinite love, and God does not do evil things. A thousand times no. The cancer that takes a young mother's life, a child run over by a drunk driver, the gas ovens of Auschwitz, these are not part of God's plan. God did not will this evil. Stalin did the slaughter in Ukraine. Hitler did the gas ovens. On and on, there's something else going on. An enemy, the devil, greater than the sum of its parts. It's not only our enemy, it's God's enemy. So please, dear friends, never say, God did this. I don't believe it. So the first thing is, it's okay to cry out to God and say, God, what is going on? Second thing, God didn't do it. An enemy did it. Now there's mystery around that, and I know that raises another host of questions. But the third point of this parable is the last word is always God's. The last word is good. At the end of the day, the ultimate victory is God. Tom Long in his book says this, God is indeed perfect non-coercive love. But this perfect love poured out on the cross burns down the gates of hell and destroys the powers of evil and death. How this happens, we do not know. But for those who stand open-mouthed in astonishment at Easter's empty tomb, we know it's true. And it is the risen Christ, the wounds still marking his hands, who will send angels. And they, in the words of the parable, will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, and the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. I've told you before, but I'll tell you again, when Siobhan, our daughter, had come out of the accident and wasn't yet able to speak, she'd come out of the coma. And one day I was there by myself with Siobhan and she looked up and I thought she was, she couldn't talk, but I thought she was looking up to the air conditioning duct and wondering what that was about. But somehow she conveyed it was more than that. She was looking past the air conditioning duct and she was asking me why. What? Why? <laughs> why did God let this happen? You know, when you're with your daughter and you, she asks you that kind of question. I said, you know, sweetheart, I, I don't know. I don't know. But I know these three things are true. I know God didn't do it or cause it. I know that. I know God loves you incredibly amount, very, very much. And I know God is right here with you today and tomorrow and forever. And somehow, I don't know why, somehow maybe it's the faith she learned in Sunday school, somehow this didn't push Siobhan away from God but drew her closer. Tomorrow she's going to give the devotional at the MOPS program. 
her life verse didn't change after this. Jeremiah 29, 11. God, I know the pl- God says, I know the plans I have for you. They're for good and not for evil. And I mean, there was a period when she said, God, what are you talking about? <laughs> plans for good and for evil, that wasn't part of it. And she's lived into this mystery. One of my preacher friends showed the video of Siobhan and and Siobhan and said, thanks, Siobhan. It was, I showed that. What a gift. And Siobhan shot right back, oh, but what a price. She's realistic. But she holds on, I think, to these three things. God didn't do it. Didn't cause it. God loves her very much. God is with her. And God is with you and with me. Would you pray with me? God, there's just so much mystery in this world, but and we pray today for everybody that we know and those we don't know who've lost their faith because of the issue of suffering. May they maybe hear this sermon online or may they somehow be brought to reconsider that maybe they're rejecting a God who isn't really God. Draw us close to you, O loving God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.